Today it's my pleasure to introduce you to John McDonald, CEO of Clear Object, Inc. Magazine's fastest growing IT company in Indiana for the past three years. With that, I'll pass it over to John. Hey everybody, it's John McDonald. Great to be with you today, wherever you happen to be. It's uh, a pleasure to share with you um, a little bit of a story that uh, will help you understand what's going on in the world around us. Um, first of all, what I want you to uh, imagine is a, uh, you driving down the road in your car, and it's in the middle of the night, maybe 3 in the morning, and your car thinks that you might be tired because you've been weaving in your lane a little bit. It also knows that not too far up the road is a 24-hour coffee shop and that you like chai lattes. And so on the uh, screen of your car radio comes the message, uh, would you like a chai latte? And if you say yes, uh, it will beam your payment information ahead, order the chai latte for you so that you can go through the drive through and pick it up uh, and drive off the car thus having saved its own life as well as yours. Um, sounds pretty Star Trek-ish, uh, but I can tell you with great confidence that every car rolling off the production line today has the ability to do what I just said. And what enables that? What enables it is an explosion of software in everyday devices. Uh, the uh, Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor, which is a device largely conceived of in the late 1970s, has 1.7 million lines of software code in it. Uh, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, designed in the early 1990s, has 6.5 million lines of software code in it. But the 2018 Mercedes-Benz S550 has more than 20 million lines of software code in it, 14 million of which are in the radio alone, making it the most sophisticated computing device most people will touch on a daily basis, and it has to boot successfully in two seconds every time you turn the car on. What does all of that software and those devices enable? It enables a flood of data, data that in many ways is the basis of the new economy. The new economy is based on data and its source is everyday objects. Bold statement, but let me back it up. Think about all of the data points that are necessary to be collected and correlated for you to know that you're too tired and your car to know that you need coffee. Loyalty programs, time of day, operating hours, weather information, behavioral patterns, spatial awareness, your preferences of what kind of coffee you like, your ordering history, how you've tend to driven in the past, where you are in your lane, how far away you are from the coffee, all these data points have to be collected and understood to be able to understand that you need coffee. In fact, if you wanted to, you could collect all these data points in advance and put together some fairly sophisticated models that with only the smallest amount of live data, you could infer great meaning. For instance, you're driving down the road in your car at 3 a.m., 80% chance you might need coffee. You wiggle in your lane ever so slightly, 100% chance. That data unlocks what it is that you need in the context of where you happen to be. In fact, in some ways, it betrays you. And it provides the baseline for what is really the future of all businesses. It is the creator and destroyer of all value. Unless we think that this is not already occurring, I'll make, a, I'll make this point. The world's biggest hospitality company is Airbnb, not Hilton, not Marriott, and they don't own any hotels. Uh, the world's biggest retailer is Alibaba, and they don't own any stores. The world's biggest distributor of content is Facebook, and they make no content. The world's biggest broadcaster is Netflix, and they don't have a single studio. And the world's biggest car rental company in the whole world is Uber, and they do not own any vehicles. And what do they own? They own data. In fact, they own so much data that they are able to build multi-billion dollar businesses on it without either even owning the single asset on which that data comes from. Why is this happening? Well, the whole history of the Internet has really been about an Internet of people. The devices that we carry around, like the cell phone on the screen, are really just designed to make us smarter endpoints to the Internet. My body has five senses in it, the iPhone that I carry around has 12, all of which are designed to make me a smarter endpoint to the Internet. In fact, that iPhone is kind of stupid. Um, it doesn't even really keep time well. 
if you accidentally leave it on when you fly in an airplane the long distance, the first thing that the, the iPhone does is correct the clock inside of it because it can't even keep internal time without being connected to the Internet. And though we say we carry around all of human knowledge in our pocket, the reality is there's very little actual information on the iPhone. Uh, all it really is is in the cloud and about that. Uh, in the early era of computing, um, we would uh, centralize all data and information on these big computers that we called mainframes. And we connected to them with these devices called dumb terminals, which were stupid. Uh, they didn't even have the ability to uh, keep time, let alone like your, your watch does or your phone. Uh, in fact, the only thing they were good for if they weren't connected to a mainframe was to heat up your office a little bit like a space heater. But then uh, from about 1980 to 2000, we got the bug of pushing all of this data and applications out to the edge, to these things we call personal computers, PCs. But there were a few things we never really solved about that, like um, how do you make sure that's the right data? Uh, how do you make sure that you have the most current applications? How do I know you're supposed to see that data, and how do I keep you from walking away from it with it? So what we did was we re-centralized everything in the new form of the mainframe, the cloud, and handed out the new form of dumb terminal, a cell phone. But things they are changing because that explosion of smarts that 20,000 lines of code in that, in that car. The smarts burned into your home appliances like dishwashers. The uh, smart connectivity tools we use to run our factories today. Uh, the data we can gather from trucks. All of these things are in fact redistributing all of the data and the smarts back out to the edge, just like it was in the client-server era. And what it does is it changes the role of the cloud from being the place where all data goes to the place where only selected data goes to be understood and interpreted. In fact, and this is a fairly bold statement, it is the fourth major reorganization structure of our global economy. Again, a bold statement, but let me back it up. Uh, the first major organization structure was agrarian, farmers, growing things. Uh, you go farm so I don't have to, and I'll go buy your farming products in a local market. Prior to that, everybody had to farm and gather stuff. Now only a few of us had to do it. The next one was the Industrial Revolution, making things. You go work in a factory and make things, and I'll buy them in a marketplace. Prior to that, everybody had to make everything for themselves. Their furniture, bowls, spoons, everything had to be done prior to that by artisans on a local level or by you individually. Now you could buy things in stores that were pre-made in factories. The third major organization structure, although it's been fairly recent, so some people don't necessarily uh, see it, a lot's been written about it, is a, is a reorganization of our economy around moving things. This happened shortly after uh, World War II when we got things like interstate highways, uh, jet air transport, container ships, uh, things that make it effortless, really, for us to move things around uh, the, the world. It allowed me to buy that cell phone that I showed a minute ago online and have a direct ship from the factory in China. That would be an impossibility not even 20 years ago. And now it's a reality of every day. But here comes the fourth economy, and it's based on data. And that becomes the creator and destroyer of the value of all things. Let me explain what I mean. There are five levels of autonomous vehicles. I guess you could say there might be six if you count level zero, which is no autonomy at all. Level one is in most cars today and can be best represented by cruise control. You can set the speed of the car at a certain sp a speed as you fly down the freeway to your destination, and it will keep that speed unless you tap the brake or push a button. Level two can best be uh, described by adaptive cruise control. Uh, this is sensors on the car that can determine if you are moving too close to the car in front of you and automatically ease up on the gas pedal to keep you from plowing into the car in front of you. Level three uh, is uh, in some very high-end vehicles, and it can be best thought of as steering cruise control. Not only can you set the speed, but also you can take your hands off the wheel as you fly down the freeway, and it will stay in the lane automatically without you having to steer the car within some tolerance range. 
level four autonomous vehicles can be pre-programmed to drive the pa passenger from one location to another without driver input under most normal conditions and fail safely, meaning if there's a road closure ahead, the car will pull over and stop and wait for driver input. And level five vehicles, as shown on the screen for those of you who are following along with the home game, have no steering wheel. Level four sounds pretty cool to me. I want to be able to get in my car and be able to drive from one place to another without having to touch the steering wheel. Again, sounds fairly fanciful until you realize that all you have to do is Google Ford and, uh, and level four autonomous vehicles and you'll be brought to a website called Ford 2021 where they lay out their plan for having fully autonomous vehicles in operation by the 2021 model year. And unless you're listening to this uh, a lot later than we're recording it today, it's 2018 and that's only three years away. So Ford Motor Company is staking its reputation and also I might add GM and all the other major manufacturers of having a vehicle that will drive itself from one location to another without driver input under most normal conditions in just a little under three years. In that world, a lot of things change. First one is, you don't have to um, have as many roads. Why? Well, we have to have so many roads because we as humans can only react ever so quickly to the changing road conditions in front of us. But if the cars are driving themselves, you can run them bumper to bumper. In fact, you might want to because you can reduce the amount of energy used to pilot those cars by doing so, as any uh, Indy 500 car driver can tell you. The second thing you can do is apply that concept to delivery vehicles. For those of you you can see the screen, what you see is an actual prototype UPS autonomous delivery vehicle. And out the top of a hatch is popping a drone, a drone that is carrying a box from inside the vehicle to your front porch, which, by the way, is likely how drones are going to be used kind of an open switch to fly things across a big city, but if you can drive a vehicle out to the end of your street and just to use a drone to ferry things from the front door to the, to the, to the, to the box, uh, probably uh, a better use of a drone. So think about this world for a second. You go online and you order a T-shirt, let's say, and 15 minutes later, this truck rolls to the end of the street and out the top pops this drone and drops the box on your doorstep. You open the box and you discover, much to your horror, that the t-shirt's the wrong size. So you put it back in the box and put it back on your doorstep, make a couple more clicks, and 15 minutes later, this vehicle rolls out again, picks up the old box, and drops a new box on your doorstep with the right size t-shirt in it. In that world, to be fair, you don't need stores. And if you don't think that that's already happening, think about all of the store chains that have closed down completely or more than 500 stores in the last six months. It's already happening. Now apply that idea to healthcare. What's one of the main reasons why we need to go to hospitals and clinics? The answer is to access equipment that's difficult to move and people that know how to use it. But what if instead, if it was time for me to get an MRI, like say on my knee, instead of going to a hospital or clinic, a van pulls up in front of my house. I punch a code in the door and the door pops open and this is what I see. I see an MRI machine, nobody in there. Sit down on the MRI machine, push the big red button. On the left-hand screen comes the world-renowned expert in running MRIs machines and on the right screen comes the world-renowned expert in interpreting MRI results. Hold still, Mr. McDonald. All right, we know what's wrong with your knee. Uh, if you'll just sort of get up and close the door behind you, we're going to send an autonomous delivery vehicle out with a brace in about 15 or 20 minutes to put it on your knee. In that world, you don't need hospitals. Apply that idea to recreational vehicles, which sounds sort of frivolous on the surface. Why would I need that? But I live in Indianapolis, and if I wanted to go to Chicago tonight, to be fair, it's sort of a pain in the butt. I have to go pack a bag, trundle it down the staircase, put it in my car, drive a few, three, four hours to Chicago, or maybe drive to the airport, go through the TSA, wait in line, fly to the other side, get a car, drive downtown, ride an elevator up, and what a pain in the butt. It's, what if instead my hotel room came and picked me up tonight? 
What if instead I just trundled my bag out my front door into my hotel room and it drove me to Chicago? In that world, you don't need Hertz. You don't need Hilton. You don't need Southwest Airlines. Because I don't have to run that vehicle at 55 miles an hour. It's an autonomous vehicle. I can run it at 200 miles an hour. In fact, I might just want to go to Chicago for lunch. All possible in that world. In fact, what we will determine very soon is that the unsafe part of driving is you, the human. In the course of listening to this webinar, several unfortunate Americans will lose their lives in traffic accidents. At some point, we will realize that all of those accidents are preventable. This will likely begin on the back roads of northern Montana or something, where the freeway will be designated automated only from, say, 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. In other words, you won't be legally allowed to drive a vehicle uh, unless it's an automated only mode. And at some point, we'll extend that to include all interstate freeways and perhaps state highways later. It's probable, though, that it won't necessarily reach all roads. It's pretty hard to pilot an autonomous vehicle through a loading dock in Manhattan. But that being said, most normal driving will eclipse uh, the ability of humans to be able to pilot those cars at the speed and the distances and tolerances needed, and we will, in fact, ban people with their hands on the wheel and most uh, limited access highways and freeways in America. But think about it through another lens. Um, the average American spends 101 minutes driving on a daily basis, average American. Uh, you will drive for about 61 years, which means that every year you will have 37, or over your lifetime, you will spend 37,935 hours driving or watching road reflectors zip by, listening to your radio. There's 221.7 million registered drivers in America, which means that cumulatively, we will waste 8.4 trillion hours over our lifetimes watching road reflectors zip by, and we're about to get all of that time back. It's, in fact, the biggest one-time leap in human productivity ever. How will we use that time? Well, to be fair, some people will be lazy a question I frequently get is, are we all going to turn into Wally and have everybody serve us, you know, sodas all day long? And to be fair, some people will be lazy and just sit around and not use that time. But a lot of us won't. And it gives us an amazing amount of brain power to turn to things that we may not have been able to solve yet as human beings. I look forward to living in that world. But here's something to consider just for a minute. All those examples I just gave you, that's just cars. Apply that concept to everything that you touch, every device, every machine, every place you go, everything in your home, everything in a factory, everything in your city, and you only begin to scratch the surface of the amazing world that we're all about to live in based on the data-driven services that are wrapped around everyday things. It is, in fact, the great creator and destroyer of all value going forward in humanity. What is enabling this? Well, a few things. The first enabler is planet-wide networking. The picture on your screen is an actual map of the Internet. Uh, the color coding indicates the wires in certain parts of the, well, the globe. The places where it's white have a mixture of traffic from all continents so that you can't really tell a color from them. They, they coalesce together. This explosion in everything being connected is relatively new in the course of humanity. Um, when I was in college not so long ago, I vividly remember seeing the Internet for the first time uh, on a small little screen in a lab in a college long before the rest of the planet had seen it. Uh, now we take it for granted. That planet-wide networking is a key enabler of all of this. The second enabler is the amount of connected devices on this planet. What you see on your screen is a graph of the number of connected devices starting in 2015, 15.41. 15 
uh, going up in billions, going up to 75.44 billion in 2025. But the the teal blue line that remains relatively fat, uh, flat, uh, considering the other, is the global population, as estimated by the United Nations over that same time period. So that results in today having 2.1 connected devices per human on the planet, to in 2025 having 9.3 for every human being walking the earth. It's an amazing amount of connected devices that are connecting in through the networks we saw a minute ago. Another one is the explosion of cloud IoT platforms. Um, what's really customers are after and companies are after is access to their data. And, and so there's been an explosion of platforms that allow you to very quickly build custom elements that help you get at and understand that data. Uh, this is a graph of all of the IoT, 450 IoT platforms that are being tracked and the amount of revenue uh, that would trail off to the right-hand side by about five or six times if you were plotting them all on this graph. There's an explosion in the amount of on-demand infrastructure available to you to be able to build systems that prior to now uh, would have taken months or years to implement, and millions of dollars. The next concept is mesh networking. My mother, uh, love her to death, but she'll never be able to put an SSID in a clothes washer. <laughs> it's not going to work for her. It's got to be so simple that you just roll it in and plug it in and it's connected. So, so how do we make that work? So there's this concept called mesh networking that says, look, I walk into a plaza like this one and I have a cell phone and because I walk up close to you, it already knows that you have a cell phone in your pocket and it makes a connection without me having to do anything. Of course, you were already standing there, and it had already connected to another cell phone not so far away, and then another one in the building next door, and another one, and another one, and so on, and so on, and so on, until everything is connected without anybody having to do anything. Of course, then you only need a network connection for the places that you don't naturally have a way to create a bridge of all those connections to the place where somebody wants to be, like the middle of a park. This is one of the main reasons why Google bought Nest, the thermostat company. That's a little curious. Why would uh, Google need a thermostat company? Well, what's one thing that's in everybody's home? A thermostat. Be a great place to seed a network connection and be able to control that point where all the data is collected in the house, which is the main driver behind that purchase. Another concept is blockchain. A lot of stuff written about this. What's blockchain? What it really is is it's a simple way to be able to verify that a packet of data is authentic and came from a known source and to create a public record of how that data has been transferred from its source through every person or a machine that handled it from the beginning until now. It was actually created to backstop cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, but it actually may be more useful in the context of IoT to be able to know from where that data came from, what device, and who handled it along the way and make sure that it's authentic, which is why blockchain has got a lot of things going for it in IoT. So how do we get at this? Well, here at ClearObject, we go through a methodology to be able to understand and help customers figure out what it is that they want to do with IoT. Four steps. The first one is to recognize that you have a problem. It's the first step to recovery. There are people inside of organizations that desperately want to see change happen to their product. They see what's happening to the world around them and are um, desperate to figure out how to make their product work in this new data-driven world. Maybe you're one of those people listening today. But the first thing we like to do with you is get you out of the office. Because <laughs> what we want to do is get you in a place where you're comfortable to share with us what it is that you're thinking, what it is you want to do. We help you externalize that idea, not just by getting out of the office, of course, but also getting it out of your head. Design thinking is a great way to do this. We do this, lots of companies do as well. And it really helps to shape and form what it is that you're doing. Um, next is we have to catalyze that idea into a prototype, or an MVP as we like to say in the tech business. This is a curious intersection of ideation that comes from design thinking and edge network technology and sensors and, and security and development exercises, building code around what it is that those devices are sending and deploying those things to a cloud infrastructure and then managing 
not only the project, but also the process of delivering that and operating it after it's been built. So putting those pieces together is really what a Internet Systems Integrator does, like ClearObject and others. And those things are the necessary task to be able to take that idea and turn it into something you can touch and play with and share. Uh, with other people in your organization, why do you need to do that? Because you need to get it funded. <laughs> you need to figure out what you're going to do with that innovation. Are you going to turn it into a new product? Are you going to fold it into the next release of the product you already have? Are you going to create a whole new product line around the innovation? Or are you going to spin off that idea and create a whole company around it? All those are options that you can use to be able to capitalize on that. Four steps to be able uh, to make those things work. So what are some of the impacts that this has on society? Well, I'll give you a few. First one is, uh, first question I often get is, uh, what is the impact on jobs in our society? Um, jobs are, uh, you know, going to change without any question. Um, but people say, well, look, what about all those poor truck drivers when you have autonomous trucks? Well, um, doesn't, it means that the truck is not necessarily going to not have a driver. In fact, if you gang a whole bunch of trucks together, you can actually create over-the-road train systems that um, still need things like conductors. The job of a truck driver doesn't go away. It just changes into someone who is um, really piloting a whole bunch of trucks along the road. How does this change our education? Well, unfortunately in America, very few people are actually getting through our college system as it is currently described. Uh, we have a huge number of people. Here in Indiana, if you are a high school graduate, uh, there's only about two-thirds of you will go to college. Only about half of those people will actually get a degree in the field that they studied, and very few of them will be able to continue to parlay that into a job future. And part of the reason for that is because when we originally put together our education system, it was designed to turn out farm workers and factory workers. But a lot of the research has been done to determine that a lot of our high school graduates are starting to thumb their nose at this system. The number of businesses owned by college graduates has been plummeting over the last four years, while the number of businesses owned by less than a high school diploma has been skyrocketing. These are high school students that are saying, I can code. Uh, I can build websites. I can interpret data that's coming back from devices. I can build a business around myself. And so the idea of being able to be a part of this economy, this gig economy, and give my skills and technical skills over in a marketplace is also a side effect of this data-driven economy where the individually marketable skills of humans can now be brought together into companies in a much more dynamic way. I often get questions about security. Um, I uh, type in my credit card number when I order a product online and I get this queasy feeling in my stomach, but then I go to a restaurant and I hand the waiter my credit card and he walks away and I don't even think anything about it. What's the difference? Well, the difference is the difference between real and perceived security. Humans cannot trust computers. And so even though you have a very limited interaction with that waiter, you have a human bond. So that if you get a bad errant charge on your credit card, the first thing you think of is the waiter. So we can build IT systems that cover off on real security issues in the Internet of Things, but it's very difficult to cover off on perceived security issues. The best example of that I can think of is the TSA. It's a massive system for covering off on a perceived security issue. Everybody knows that you're not really necessarily safer for doing this, but yet everybody goes through this process, and it doesn't really necessarily make us safer. In fact, that concept of being able to have that gig economy is something so amazing to consider um, because what it really means is that we're going to transition our world and the business world from being a place where we're really just sort of an arms dealer for companies trying to get at their own data into a place where really millions of us humans can offer up our skills in context of what we can do wherever we are on the planet, really a marketplace of humans and people that um, – are all available to collect data, interpret data, come up with new business models, and apply all that free time to be able to solve problems that we as humans have not yet been able to resolve. That's the impact of the Internet of Things. That's the impact of the data economy. And that's what we're all about at Clear Object. And thanks for listening to us today for just a few minutes.